Jerry, and I'm going to facilitate this session. And today's session, uh, our session is titled, the catalog uh, session is titled, uh, Catalog Perspective Tools and Training. And uh, while there is a lot of discussions on ontology development and conservation and whatsoever, we haven't uh, talked about a lot, we talk a lot about what kind of things that will impact as a catalogers and so on. So our session is divided in two uh, parts. So part one is about catalogers, uh, the tools in UI perspective. And part two is solely focused on discussions about what kind of trainings that we need to do, and if, uh, if so, then what kind of model that we need to do that, and so on. So the first session is going to be open to oh, uh, But uh, before I start this session, I'd like to thank you, Jennifer, because <laughs> the opening slide is from her slide in all of this. And part one, first session is uh, introduced by Tim Thompson, uh, Timothy Thompson, and he is the uh, Discovery Metadata Librarian at Yale University Library and the co-leader at U uh, Yale's LD4P, LD4P, I'm sorry, LD4P project. Uh, and his interests include data modeling and applications of machine learning in libraries. So he's going to lay out what kind of things that we need to question or discuss about MJ. So, I really just want to set the context for this discussion. I proposed this this session, um, and interestingly, it actually came out of my thinking about UIs in relation to training um, for catalogers. So, uh, just to give a little bit of the background, I did a, a couple of mini workshops at Yale um, introducing the basic bit frame model to a range of staff, um, some professionals and other, um, you know, other staff members. And I wanted to come up with a tool that would give some, an opportunity for hands-on experience in a way that would kind of gently force people to interact with bit frame um, directly. So consulting the documentation while doing some kind of hands-on data entry. Um, it didn't, the idea didn't, kind of didn't fully coalesce. So some, that was kind of what led me to think about, so how do we how do we do training in a way that engages people, um, not just with production ready tools like the BitFrame editor, but in a way that's a little, maybe a little bit more um, basic than that, in a way that will help people to process new concepts that, that might be initially foreign to them. So the, the catalogers is. <laughs> oh, and I, I should say uh, as a caveat, just before I I, move, I go on. Um, so I'm, I'm by no means an expert on design, on usability, cognition, human computer interaction. Uh, I'll leave that part to Huda. So. <laughs> so the the way we think of cataloging as a craft is bound up with the arcane and archaic interfaces that we use for metadata creation. And this is a little bit more archaic than perhaps what we use uh, these days, but, but it gives that sense. And I think, uh, you know, what I, my, my kind of take on this is that our interfaces shape or have shaped the way um, that we conceptualize and our, our mental models really of catalogers and cataloging. So who is the cataloger um, as kind of an archetype, I guess. And is there anything else here? So these are just some motivating questions that I came up with that we might refer back to um, once we, we stop, we pause for discussion of this half of the, the program. So how do cataloging interfaces shape our understanding of what it means to be a professional cataloger? How are catalogers shaped by the interfaces they use? What kinds of tools and interfaces are most conducive to training catalogers for mastery of linked data and semantic modeling concepts as a practical part of their daily work? That's a mouthful. So cataloging without a safety net is like how I, is how I like to think of the way most people do. <laughs> Bar cataloging. 
And on the one hand, when you think, stop to think about it, it's kind of appalling just when you calculate the number of the lifetimes <laughs> and years that have been spent in front of this <laughs> interface. <laughs> but I, I, I count several, you know, at least in dog years, several lifetimes <laughs> myself. So, and it just, it is, you know, of course it does kind of work, it gets the job done, but it's kind of baffling to think that we have been willing to settle for this um, as a profession. And, uh, I mean, when you sit down in, in front of, or this is, this, well, I, maybe I shouldn't name the vendor, but <laughs> <laughs> you can probably recognize it. Uh, so what happens cognitively when someone sits down to create a catalog record using a tool like this uh, in the MARC formats. How many mental steps and checks does a cataloger have to go through to validate a record in their head? Um, so, so there is, it does get back to this idea of cataloging as a craft. So that, I mean, there are different meta metaphors you could think of. Um, I, don't, I didn't want to use this one because it's a gendered metaphor, but it, it kind of lends itself to think of a cataloger as a monk or as a, as a savant. So, because this interface is so, I mean, to, to use it in a way that you end up creating a record that's fully conformant to standards uh, requires a, a level of, of, of internalization, I think, of, of standards and rules and local practice that, that's really kind of um, mind-boggling when you think about it. I did try to do a literature review, an exhaustive literature review for this. I came up with two articles. <laughs> <laughs> so actually the most relevant, two of the most relevant articles were, uh, one was a, a short, actually I don't know if, if Kevin's piece was necessarily uh, related to this topic, but it, he did mention a use case for uh, an instructor who wanted to design an interface for students to do cataloging. And MJ, uh, her wow. co-authored <laughs> co co article was actually kind of the, the only article that I really found that was kind of doing a systematic um, presentation of a cataloging interface, so congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it's, but it really is an area that I think needs more work, um, just to understand kind of as we're designing new systems, what role does cognition play in it, what are the, the human-computer interaction issues at play? Um, so, just to, I, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I wanted to do some really quick demos of a couple of raw RDF editors. So, when I was uh, doing the, preparing for these mini workshops on BibFrame, um, so I wanted to, to think about what's the most stripped down way that you could present RDF to someone in a way that would kind of be akin to the way we work in a MARC environment, in our, in our MARC editing environments. So I came up with, this is just a very um, schematic interface that this was the one that I wanted to use for the workshop and didn't really work. But, um, but if you think about just getting people to process, to think in terms of triples, so, so this is not, specific to BibFrame, but we were you know, talking about BibFrame. So, so a subject or a work, uh, so the idea is that you would think in terms of classes and properties. So you could have a work with a title, which is you need to understand what a resource and a literal is, that the, the, the range of the title property is a title, it's an instance of title, and then you would just kind of chain things from there. So, uh, so yeah, so the, the idea was that people would go along and as they filled in the subjects and predicates, they would have to actually consult the BibFrame documentation. So this is kind of where the training piece fits into the discussion. Because I, I think when you're using a tool like the, the BibFrame editor, it's, it's much more, it, well, to some extent, it's a more guided experience. Um, and there's a little less cognitive load, which I think is, is a good thing. Um, but if we're doing training, introducing people to concepts, we might want to 
strip things down a little bit more. Um, there's another tool which is which is more robust than than the, the, the toy editor that I came up with. So it's uh, produced by OpenLink Software, which has a whole a suite of, of software for, for uh, working with different linked data standards and protocols. Um, so this is a very literal <laughs> take on creating data in RDF. So I, I actually copied a snippet here from the, the mark to bit frame comparison tool. So it lets you import data in different ways. I'm gonna import this turtle here. Oh, forgot to strip that out. You can see this, it's not meant to be user friendly. <laughs> okay, maybe that will work. Yep. Okay, so that just parses the triples and then gives you this tabular view. It's kind of similar um, to what Andrew Lee was showing in his Wikidata um, kind of smorgasbord of tools that he demoed. There was one called Tabernacle, I believe, which basically let you run a Sparkle query and edit the results and then push those to Wikidata. Um, so you can edit things here. You can link different vocabularies. You know, if you wanted to add bit frame, it, it recognizes the current um, URI for the bit frame ontology. And, but it's not, it's, I, I, I haven't really used this tool in depth, but it is, it's not completely intuitive. Um, like I'm not. I, I think you would have to define a base URI. I'm not really clear about how you would go about some of these things. But if you wanted to just add a, a title resource, um, so yeah, I'm not sure how you would specify that the type of the title of that that entity is a title, but. So that, that's kind of how that works, and you know, this might be a, in terms of training, this might be a more robust tool that would kind of force people to think more in more detail about RDF as a standard and kind of the underpinnings, the scaffolding, the nuts and bolts. Um, so, but for kind of an initial um, introduction to BitFrame, you might want something that's a little simpler. So. So those are just kind of the issues that I wanted to raise in framing this, and um, I'll turn it over to our first lightning talk presenter, and hopefully we can circle back to some discussion of this, and maybe people have examples from their own experience they can share.
2013, in fact, it began as, a, as part of the contract with Zafira, um, who was contracted principally to explore the idea of bib frame profiles. Uh, but one of the things that Zafira believes in and we believe in is that there's exploration and creating a spec, but then, or, or something like, or putting together the concept of a profile and then also having to make something that can make use of that profile or that spec. Um, and so they actually did a prototype um, and then demo editor for that. But the main um, product that came out of that contract was the bid frame profile spec um, in conjunction with, again, this, this, this early prototype. They, in fact, demoed that in, at, at ALA Midwinter in 2014. Um, it was called Scribe. It's still called Scribe. I don't know if, how active it is, but it's up on Zavira's website. You can check it out. If you do take a look at it, you'll see exactly how much inspiration um, we derived from that for the boot frame editor. But after that contract ended, we, uh, being LC, L, L, we being LC, had promised a fully featured editor by ALA in 2014, and so it began the life of what we know today. Scribe was built in Angular JS uh, version 1.2. Unless you're a coder, that may not be terribly meaningful, but it's a very old version of uh, Angular, and I bring it into the conversation because the Bitframe editor did not go with this solution. Uh, it didn't fully implement the profile spec, the, the, the one that we um, put out. It didn't have support for export a save feature, um, so and or the export C feature produced that didn't, didn't produce RDF that matched the model. I bring in the, principally I bring in the Angular to, to say though that one of the decisions we decided not to do was go with Angular, uh, mostly because they were already talking at this time about Angular 2.0. Um, and we didn't want to find ourselves locked into 1.2 and continue on with what Zafira had built. So it is nevertheless built out of pure JavaScript. It's connected to any framework um, which I think has by and large uh, benefited us. It is connected to the jQuery, but uh, they've kept that up to date, um, and it's allowed us to, <coughs> to keep in sync with anything um, major that's under the hood. It's completely pluggable. Um, you can take it and plug it into your own web page and use it however you want to, um, for no small part because it was uh, written in JavaScript. It was initially written in 35 days, give or take. Um, it was done on deadline, uh, and it was released in May of 2014. All of that detail, especially the timeline, goes in to say that, um, to, how it, to inform the philosophy that went into it. And which is to say two things. It wasn't really user focused. We didn't do any user focused testing, um, have to discuss having significant conversations with cataloggers or workflow when uh, Zafira did their prototype or when we um, created the BitFrame editor. Uh, that wasn't really uh, our focus at the time. Actually, what was what was focused at the time and what it was really built for um, was for the model. And it was model focused and what it was designed to do was be flexible for a changing model. So BitFrame was still in version one. The new version two was going to come. There would be significant changes to it. What we really needed was an editor that would easily adapt and change if the model underneath it altered in some way or another. I just said all this. Um, there was one exception to us uh, when, when considering users, and that was for the bottom-up cataloging. What I mean by that was the idea that you would start with an item, or worst, an instance, and then attach that item to an instance, or if you began with an instance, you attach it to a work. Um, so start with an item attached to an instance, start with an instance to attach to a create work. Show that a little more graphically, um, the green represents kind of what we had in mind. You would start with an item connect to an instance, connect to a work, not top down, beginning with a work and going down to an instance and so on. Even though it wasn't user focused, we did want to take full advantage of vocabulary lookup services that we could, um, i.e. suggest services. Um, there's been some talk about uh, integrating LDP for uh, questioning authority or OCLC services, uh, but we wanted to make it so that if we, want, if we added those services or we relatively It was most, like I said, model, model focused. Profiles reflect models and their characteristics. Um, that's what a bit frame profile does. We knew the bit frame model would change, 
and until the model crystallized firmly, we needed to be able to uh, accommodate arbitrary models. Um, and it needed to be able to accommodate expansive graph data, a graph of data. So if you started with an item and it didn't have an instance and you had to do the instance, and if you had to do a work, it would be able to capture all of that um, and submit it in one time. To drive home exactly how flexible this is, I mean, under the, I mean, basically we call it the BitFrame editor, but it is by and large a generic RDF editor. Um, if you have an RDF model and you can express that in a BitFrame profile, um, you can use the editor to do that. And in fact, back in 2014, I threw two profile, profiles together um, just to see you know, how flexible that would work. Um, so there's a SCOS in BitFrame and a Dublin Core in BitFrame both of which can make use of the lookups. And if you go to those two addresses, the code underneath there is actually the same code for 2014 um, running. So it's, it's been relatively stable since. There have been loads of changes. Um, if anyone was in the LC presentation yesterday, you saw Matt um, demo uh, a, large of the, uh, a, 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 number of the, a number of these enhancements. There's been loads of changes to the backend architecture, uh, making it slightly less pluggable, but it's still, you can separate those parts relatively easily. There's been additional support for uh, profile elements and is now used in a production setting, which of course it wasn't um, you know, just back in 2014. Loads of user focus enhancements have actually occurred over that time, which is a great thing. We have actually started talking to catalogers. Um, more lookup options, uh, user templates to suppress uh, profile elements. Basically, we're making the screen smaller and more focused for the catalog. Actually, the catalog is making the screen smaller and more focused for him or herself. Uh, Tighten space to for catalog efficiency, language tags, or those types of ideas. So, uh, the code is all available if you want to check it out. The, there is a demo fully online if you would like to check it out, and that's that's how it came to be. So, if it if it reflects a model, that's pretty much why it existed. this, 
and how does it um, uh, link to other authors and other works and, and making it, making sure you're picking the right Jane Smith out of, of whatever 400 Jane Smiths there are. Um, and as we are, you know, in the LD4 uh, family of grants, um, as we're interested in looking at how to take the cataloging world and um, uh, transition it to linked data, uh, we're dealing with ontology. So we're we're trying to we're moving away from some of the underlying ways of thinking about um, what what a catalog is, what a record is, to a more linked data um, model. Uh, so we we have to, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, deal with ontologies. Um, and uh, how does this, what does this mean for the, for the interface? What does this mean for the cataloger? What parts of this do we expose and, and not? You know, how does this work? Um, and since we're moving from strings to things, um, the ability to actually search for and uh, look uh, up external or look up data sources is becoming more and more important. Um, we may also want to pull from this to start populating um, the, the forms that we use for, for cataloging. So those are sort of some central questions that have uh, governed um, how we are thinking about this. Um, it's interesting, Tim was like, oh, uh, Huda will talk about all the details. I'm actually not gonna talk about all the details <laughs> about what the user experience process is, except to say that um, it's meant to be iterative, um, and it's meant to try to understand um, both from speaking with the users um, and, and getting information about um, what they think they do and sort of observing them as they do it. Um, also moving to uh, prototyping and, and developing systems that you can then go back to them and evaluate uh, those systems uh, with them. And it's iterative, so you're not, you know, you're never quite done. You, you, if you really want to improve, you keep going back um, and learning. And in a way, we've done this because we uh, we keep trying to build cataloging interfaces and keep trying to evaluate them. So there, there's that. Um, in the previous grants, the LD4L Labs and LD4T grants. We worked on, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna start going through this, the different systems and what we learned. Um, this is supposed to be a five minute talk, so, but I, I have a little leeway here, so hopefully I will stay fairly close to that. Um, what we did is we took uh, a vitro, the, uh, the vitro system, which is a system where you can take any ontology and give it to the system and it will generate an interface where you can add data uh, using the properties that are defined in the ontology. And we took that and tried to um, customize that specifically for BibFrame and our related ontologies that we were um, helping catalogers cataloging. So this is a screenshot on the left that shows uh, someone trying to add um, a contribution. Um, you have a lookup where you can go and look up information against the Library of Congress name authority file and they can select that. Um, we had to make customizations that it wasn't just like here's a bunch of ontology properties that you were seeing because it turned out when we first showed catalogers that, they sort of looked at that and us with great confusion and we knew immediately we had to change something. Um, our feedback uh, approach, uh, I won't go through all of that, is, is uh, was multifaceted and continues to be so. So you know, we can speak to the catalogers, we can also try to actually experiment um, with the particular prototype. This shows uh, a screen where we're bringing in context and this is important because we wanted to support catalogers in their disambiguation process. So. We thought um, usually they, they tend to have multiple screens open. Um, would this help with bringing in information in a way that helps them understand exactly which subject uh, best fits this particular book or which um, author they're looking at? And this is showing genre forms with some broader and narrow information that they can then start to see, um, you know, is it bluegrass music um, or is it another type of music that best fits? Some high level res uh, lessons, uh, we um, began with some assumptions that we realized were actually not true. Uh, we thought, well, original cataloging means that they won't have to ever look anything up as they start to do their work. And it turns out that there's no such thing as a you know, tabula rasa. Uh, you always want to look up um, existing works and instances. And so this was an opportunity for us to take a step back and say, uh, again, you know, really try to look at lookups, not just as, uh, and looking up external information, not just as a way of linking to it, but being able to bring information back. So we realized that was important. Um, I think, uh, Kevin, you mentioned the sort of like tight, compact display. Um, that definitely came up. Uh, if you have an interface with 100 properties you can add, and you, you know, filled out some of them, it's important for the cataloger to be able to quickly look at the information they've entered to assess the, you know, the completeness of the work. So uh, uh, sort of uh, check your work interface. 
we didn't include that, but that's something that we, we saw was useful. And context is useful. Um, they did like that. They had some comments about you know sources and things like that, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. But I think it's important to note that it's a big shift. It's not simply, here's a different tool and here's a different interface, but here's a, a different way of thinking about the pieces of information and how they fit together. And um, it's important to tease that out. So VitroLib happened, um, and there, there are uh, links in the slide uh, notes if you want to find out more about the user um, interface uh, work we did there. We took some of sort of those findings and we moved them along into our LV4 P2 grant. Um, as a starting point, since Sinopia uh, was just beginning to be developed, we wanted to assess whether our original findings about context being important, uh, we could uh, expand upon that. So we took the BitFrame editor and we um, did our own kind of version of it, uh, where we bring in context. So this goes back to the disambiguation and classification problem. So I need to know which author uh, this person actually is. And so this shows you uh, bringing in uh, the, link, uh, the links for BIAC, uh, Wikidata, and ISNI, but you can actually, within the screen, see some of this information as you're scrolling through your results. And you see the Library of Congress name of already file, and can open that up too. BIAC, unfortunately, didn't allow us to open it up in the screen, so it was a new window. Um, these are some before and after shots because as we were, uh, as we experimented uh, or evaluated this with catalogers, they said things like, yeah, this is useful, but I would really like to know um, more clearly which sources you use. So make, making sure that they're identified much more clearly in the interface. Um, and this shows sort of a, the same thing where uh, you can see, you know, what the, what the broader and narrower is and that the, that on the bottom you're looking specifically at the genre form uh, record from the Library of Congress. So speaking of hierarchies um, and uh, understanding that uh, the cataloger actually needs to be able to situate which subject heading or genre form they're looking at within the sort of network or hierarchy that that particular concept sits within to really understand if this is the best fit. We wanted to see if we could provide an interface that allowed for a more uh, graphical way to um, navigate that or to, to be able to express that hierarchy in a more uh, a, a quicker, cleaner way at a sort of a first glance. Um, so we had some feedback on this. Um, I remember we were, we were like one person completely understood exactly what this was and we were very impressed by them um, because obviously this was an idea that we were throwing out and just to see. But uh, some way to sort of show that, you know, the broader concepts are on the left, the narrower is on the right, and where it sits within this big list. Um, and I know that there's work uh, that, you know, is being done in the classification web, which as Stephen pointed out to me, that may also be relevant. So some of our findings from this round where we took the BitFrame editor prototype and tried it out with some linked data and external data um, information was contextual information is still useful, but can we also include more related works, more identifying information, and like I said, clearly identify sources. They also mentioned additional external sources, vocabularies, um, and uh, it, that it was useful to try to take that hierarchical navigation piece and try to make that better. Um, so now I'm going to switch to sort of, you know, that was the first part of the LV4P2 grant where we were looking at a prototype to assess what we could do with context. Um, Sinopia is the name of the cataloging editor, but also sort of the name of the system of components or a system of uh, applications that can allow users to create um, the profiles that they need for their forms. So, um, I, Kevin probably covered this to some extent, but you know, you have you have an ontology, you have various properties, but when you actually go for, as a user to say, I want to add a contribution, you need to know um, what the, the fields on that page will look like. You want to know where those fields will link to, and so it's, there's a sort of configuration piece that goes into that, and that is generally expressed in the BigFrame editor in a profile. And Synopia is, is uh, using that same kind of uh, conceptual structure. Uh, the Synopia ecosystem, though, has that profile editor piece where a person can actually create the profile. It's borrowing heavily from the BitFrame editor's way of thinking about things, and also the, the editor piece itself where you're actually putting in information. I'll show you some quick screenshots. But this um, first step was where our colleague Astrid Usang uh, made sure to take the workflow as a whole and take it back to the catalogers to see what they thought about it and if, if it made sense. 
this is a screenshot of the, the profile editor piece. So this is where you would actually put in information about um, for a particular property, what do you expect uh, to uh, the form to show and how it would have um, uh, behaved. Um, and the link data editor is the part where, um, as we were seeing before, you can put in information for different properties. Um, one of the um, changes we made here, and this kind of goes back to sort of the tighter, more compact view in a way, is uh, the original uh, BitFrame editor um, generally opens up a lot of modals. So if you uh, click on property, it's gonna open up another modal, and then it might have another embedded um, component in there that says, you can also look this up, and then if you click on that, it opens up yet another modal. Um, so in response to user feedback, we updated the UI pattern so that instead of having many modals that open up as you go through the properties, um, all of them, all of these different components uh, or resource templates that are embedded in the profile, for those of you that speak that language um, and know what those terms mean, um, they all show up in the UI uh, in, as expandable sections as, as modals. Modals are still possible, of course, but this gives you sort of a more, a, a quicker view of what's in there um, and uh, allows the cataloger to maintain some context of what property they're, they're actually filling out um, in case it's so as I said, Sonokia is more than just the link data editor, it's the link data editor and the profile editor. Um, we expect that when catalogers come to this, uh, they would come to a login page, and there's a help panel on the right that uh, uh, is there to provide some quick access to training um, and information. And continuing, you know, there'll be work that continues to try to make this better. So um, at some point, uh, you know, we have a history of names, I think all projects do, of names sticking to things that were not necessarily intended that way. At some point someone said, wouldn't it be great if we got uh, catalogers and developers and we put them in a room where they had to like come up with ideas of how the world should, could look, not should look necessarily, but could look if we had no restraints. And, and then someone else said, well what if we, instead of a room it was a chalet and the chalet working group was born. <laughs> um, and the chalet working group was uh, 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 two days where we all sat together and uh, try to free ourselves from all of the constraints uh, that um, we thought were in place and say, you know, if we, if we could do anything with linked data and if we could do uh, what we wanted to with the metadata, what would it look like? So I did, I want to include this uh, screen in here. Um, this goes to, again, the notion of we have a bunch of data out there that we can use and integrate uh, even in the cataloging process itself uh, where we can maybe bring information in or be able to provide interesting linkages. Um, so the cataloger on the left is, is being told that you created a bibliographic description for this work, and you can now, here are some suggestions for you that you may want to link to. Um, and as they're linking to it, uh, on the right side you're seeing, you know, you can add just the links or you can add your own information, but wouldn't it be nice if the cataloger could then immediately see what the library user would be seeing in the patron view? so that they could get a kind of, almost like an end-to-end -end summary of, we're adding these links and we're adding this context, and this is how that can help discovery, and isn't my job great? I mean, it'd be nice. <laughs> so, so that's a run-through of sort of the UI work that we've done. I've, I'm sure I've taken more than five minutes, so I'll just stop now. <laughs> project where we took the wiki base environment and evaluated it as a platform for cataloging. And I want to talk about um, an impasse we ran into, what our remedy was for it during the scope of the project and some questions I have about what that means for the future. Some quick background, project from last year, about a million entities were loaded into the wiki base from an overlap of wiki data, BF and WorldCat, and we 
guess, the project participants to use this platform and evaluate special cases like cataloging maps or uh, archival materials or photograph collections. And generally we found that as a cataloging interface, it takes some getting used to. It's been around for a while. It gets used by about 20,000 people a month for Wikidata. So it does get exercised quite a bit. It takes some orientation and practice, but once you have that, it's uh, acceptable. But the problem we ran into was if the wiki base you're working with uh, has gaps in the data and you want to connect your entity you're describing to some other one, to some relationship, that entity isn't there, well, you're kind of stuck. And I'm going to illustrate what that would look like. I hope this is readable in the back. It's a view of a collection description of stereographs scrolling down, so to speak. There is a set of statements at the top there of what the collection of stereographs will depict, including San Francisco, uh, the event of the earthquake, a refugee camp. There are other things that the archivists say this collection of stereographs depicts. One other thing is Market Street. So if I was going to use the interface to add that connection, I just start typing in. If you've seen Wikidata or used it yourself, you see how this works. Type in Market Street, it looks ahead and finds an entity that I highlight for Market Street. I hit save, and the connection is made. So that works really well. But the collection also depicts Mission Street. And if I look for that, it's not in the wiki base. And, and this is, I think, a significant instance of getting stuck because in the past, we might have felt it would be satisfactory to add a uh, 6521 field with a reference to Mission Street, or an EAD, a geog, geog name tag around that string and move on. But in a wiki base, if I'm going to say this is related to that, that has to be in the wiki base as an entity with an ID with properties. So uh, working with the passage participants, we asked them what could remedy this uh, and the advice, the idea was search in the nearby area, search in other resources. So strong family resemblance to all the past previous presentations. Uh, bring some data over and make the connections into the ontology for our project. Display the data so people have a chance to review and edit a very simple cataloging interface and then load it. And that's kind of what this is representing. So I've done a search for Mission Street and I found a match in Wikidata, upper left corner. So this, the label and a little bit of context, it says San Francisco, not really great context, but it's there. And if I click that link, it pulls the data over from Wikidata. And for the statements that are associated with this place, it takes the Wikidata properties, which could be a great many of them, and checks in our system to see which properties do you have an equivalent property for. So it found for where it's located in the country and we had those properties, so we could bring that data over. I mentioned that fingerprint data at the top, that description isn't very good. Um, it's great to have context. It's actually quite important in Wikipedia to have a little bit of context for every item. So this was an opportunity um, to get a attention paid. Human attention is such a scarce resource. And uh, Stephen Folsom mentioned the same kind of opportunity in the uh, questioning and authority connection to Discogs. You know, get, take advantage of any time someone's looking at data. You could change that description so it accounts for the two cities that Mission Street is a part of and what kind of thing Mission Street is, thoroughfare. Just scrolling down to show that there's a link back to Wikidata, so we're part of the network graph after we load this data. Uh, add it, get a queue number, and that's what it looks like. So we, now we can go back to our workflow that had been interrupted with a little bit of uh, departure. Imagine the retriever sort of like your companion in a separate browser tab looking for things. Uh, now I've got Mission Street and I can add it and move on. So of these four things that we thought the retriever could do, they're sort of more abstractly, the retriever is kind of a mix. There's a federated search of these different uh, external sources. There's a crosswalk to get properties from various vocabularies and map to one for passage. There's a mini cataloging interface and a data loader. Of those four things, for me, the second and third were challenging. That, or they create a question about how you how you balance effort. That uh, the more resources you're connecting to, the greater the synchronization challenge. Keeping track of changing data models becomes a chore. 
And for the user interface, we do want to take advantage of that opportunity to review uh, and edit, but we have a fully featured editing interface in Wikibase, so keep it to a minimum and concentrate on the things that matter the most for duplicate detection, like the fingerprint data, or <coughs> deleting statements that are erroneous. And leverage the network map, bring the data over, but make sure you can connect back out to the wider world to get more information. Um, it left us with some questions whether something like this could be generalized to move beyond just this one Wikibase instance and, and you know, how does the community engage with this question of grappling with different graphs, different vocabularies, and making connections across systems. I hope that was in my time statement. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we have three uh, great <laughs> user editors for the, the link data. So I'd like to open the questions for these three presentations. Do you have any questions for three different in, uh, uh, editor tools? Uh, Huda, mm -hmm. um, everything, um, every, I know it's early May 2019, and one of the slides you have up there said April 2019. Oh, yeah. Is all that up and visible that uh, you showed? Some of that is. Um, the, the timeline has shifted. So um, we're from, I think the initial timeline was that we would have something that we could release to um, the catalogers to use and the institutions to use in April. That shifted to uh, later. <laughs> and <laughs> probably uh, late May or June. I cannot commit to any of that right now. Um, I also don't make decisions. But anyway. Um, there is, uh, if you go to sinopia.io, there are links in the slide that uh, can lead you to documentation and possibly to a place where you can see uh, the development instance. Um, so you can see some of that. It will all be there. Tim, do you have a specific question? Well, um, well, first I just wanted to ask uh, Bruce if the code for the retriever was open source, is it available? I wish it was. Um, <laughs> we're talking about how to read work in front of my uh, uh, hesitancy is because I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, if we were to release it um, in the form it is now, it's really it's key to our particular wiki page. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can release the logo. <laughs> <laughs> but I ask because we're actually doing a, a wiki base project now at, at Yale, and I think this would be really helpful for us. Okay, well, let, I'll get back in touch then because parts of it, certainly the kind of methodology we So, in a related question, so maybe we actually posted your in, uh, introduction, introductions or tutorials for the wiki base. Is it included this kind of API of the, uh, the wiki base or something, or is it completely different? I'm, I guess I didn't follow the question. The tutorials. Okay. Yes. Uh, the maybe we posted, uh, oh, tweeted yeah. about. Yeah, that was actually work. it was uh, separate from this project. It okay. Did a, just to show how to use that very nice Docker image for Wikibase, okay. deploy it, and we supplied some kind of sample data to flow bibliograph to the data. Okay. That was separate from All right. this. Any other questions? Yes. So just to, to come back to some of the questions that I posed at the beginning. So on, so on the one hand, cataloging, legacy cataloging interfaces are kind of terrible, I think. Maybe someone disagrees with that, but I think we probably most of us agree. Um, but do they, do they enable 
an achievement of mastery of cataloging asset craft, you know, and, and, and what, how do we factor that into the design of new systems and what are we, what are we aiming for in terms of professionalization of metadata professionals, catalogers? Um, what are the skills and competencies that, that we need and how do our tools support those? So, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I was sort of thinking about this, and I've thought about this before, and um, yeah, the MARC interfaces are terrible, but in some ways, I think catalogers, and I'll speak as a, having grown up as a cataloger, we want that because we have mastered MARC, and therefore, we learned it the hard way, and making it too easy it, it is, is, is uh, we don't trust it. Yeah. You know, like, we don't know what's behind it if it's just labeled, you have to have the tags, because we don't know what the system um, so I'm wondering if um, if we're thinking about new kinds of interfaces for linked data, we don't want to lose too much of the structure, but also I don't know if we want to reproduce this making it hard. It's, it, it, the analogy that I, I drew once, which I think might fit this, is that um, medical doctors training as interns have these like impossible long days, like 48 hours on call, and because all the older doctors had to go through that too, they insist that the new ones do, even though they know it's bad for them and it's bad for medical care. So do, we don't want to reproduce something that's bad for cataloging. But I think your point about the, the, the knowing the structure underneath it is important. Yeah. I would actually like to maybe even take that further, um, which I think is that the people who become catalogers um, for the, are, are the people who actually have some bizarre affinity for Mark to begin with, and that that's not everybody. And so in the process of sort of sort of getting people to do mark cataloging, we basically left behind a huge population of people who might potentially describe resources well or have domain expertise. So do we really want to recreate that kind of technorati going forward instead of in fact creating um, resource description tools that a much broader population can engage with on an ongoing basis. We already have this issue of we're not a very diverse profession, and then we like intentionally make it this like specialized thing that requires certain kinds of mindsets to do well. Like, is that like don't we in fact want to make it easier for everybody to create resource descriptions? Like, is that should that not be the goal? Like, I don't like just because you know. I mean, I I wouldn't recommend sort of like my professional like path as like a thing that. Scales broadly, right? We can't afford that. <laughs> I, I also I can't count the number of people I've talked to who were like, yeah, I took a cataloging class in library so on. I didn't understand anything they said to me, so I just gave up, and now I don't understand any of it. And I feel like that means that if they're a reference librarian, like they're not using the catalog as well as they might if they actually like understood behind it because they got overwhelmed by mark tags and so they just gave up on the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Boy.
you want to do it? I go first? Okay, then this first. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to say something, you mentioned something about the cost, um, and I'm also noticing a lot of focus being on you know, like digital cataloging and the interface, and I'm thinking about what we do on the data we and so much of it is batch cataloging, and we provide other ways for people with subject expertise to create metadata um, in spreadsheets that then we can then transform in mass and upload them. So I think to realistically start talking about metadata creation in mass going forward, we need to make sure that we're able to continue with that kind of um, mass creation and transformation. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point. The cataloging practice, creation pr uh, practice has been really changed a lot. There was not one single model for creating metadata. I just had several comments. One, in thinking about the interface for catalogers, we should lose the idea that we're talking about professionals. And I say that when I went to get the catalog positions at LC, another great they added to it and went through the OPM process. And we were told, well, you're the Library of Congress, you would think that the librarian positions would be the highest grade positions you have because you're the expert. And so we should lose track of that. I think that ties into what um, Ask, Ask Lynn yeah. was saying in terms of coming up with ways for, well, I don't think we'll have calibers doing what calibers are doing now, 10 years from now anyway. They, they're becoming more project managers and involved in other aspects, not just sitting in front of a screen and adding data. That, I think you could train anybody to do it if they want the right tools. So that, we should lose sight of that perspective. For that, and there was another piece, but I lost it in all the comments. So someone must have said the other piece that I wanted. But those are those are the main ideas that <coughs> I'd want our catalog to remain professional and librarians. And anything we do to enhance that role, which is is almost rote and, and mundane, as opposed to things where they have to think and use their intellects. That's that's what I want them to spend their time on. So if we come up with something that looks pretty and is easy to master, that's good because then we can bring others in to do that which we wouldn't do anymore. It's still a decision-making process when you're working on a resource. Well, it can be, but it doesn't have to. You can have others who can use their reason and intellect, but it doesn't have to be someone who's trained to be a librarian and a catalog librarian. I guess that's my point. And there is a distinction there if you think about that. You may not have made that distinction so much in the past, but I think we need to now. So uh, how are we doing on time? You're fine. Do you have any other? Yeah. Well, I was just that maybe as a segue into <coughs> the discussion of training, I'm just yeah. curious to know whether people have thought about um, competencies for catalogers working in the linked data paradigm. Um, so I know that the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative has its uh, LD for PE, Linked Data for Professional Education, which actually has a sub. Uh, they, they group competencies by kind of um, functional area, so they have a group of 
competencies for catalogers. So has anyone, I'm curious to know whether anyone has looked at those or been thinking about those issues. You did raise up a point that I had forgotten, and that was looking under the hood. Uh -huh. When we were training the LC staff to take <coughs> different pilots, we were trying to come up with something that was simple and they wouldn't have to understand anything that was behind it right. or have any aspect of, of um, the web world. But they wanted to know, well, what was that? Why are we doing this? What does that mean? So I think there is a natural curiosity and intellect that librarians and catalogs have reached in the past. That was up. Yeah. yeah. I saw a hand back there. Someone who said that you had. Yeah, I, I learned about the um, core competency about a year ago. Um, and I wish that I had been studying those all along, kind of making my own training from that. Mm -hmm. So have you worked with them? That is actually a very good, good question and interesting question because in my institution, I think uh, paraprofessional cataloging staff member is more than two thirds of our cataloging force. So it could be very interesting balance what kind of education or training that we need to provide to different groups of catalogers. In my slides, Tim, for the, the training discussion, I actually have a link to that for those of you that aren't aware of it. because you created a very good tool editors for linked data or IDF and so on. But how often do you do the usability testing for your tool? And that is actually a required or not for your institution or your organization? Um, for our case, I think it depends on resources. We were developing the tool as we were testing it. We did um, a few rounds. one and a half because the very first one was like we even had to give up that for two years because everyone was just like what is this so um <laughs> and the reason for that is and it just kind of ties back to the you know i think catalogers really want to understand what's under the hood and everything but is uh simply spitting out an ontology at them the best way to do that or is there some room for trying to see if we can bring out the entities and relationships in a way that's still understandable to someone who isn't an ontology expert um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, so I think we did some of that, and then we did one, um, another round with um, a prototype and um, have people walk through it. I, I don't know that there's a standard answer to how many times. I mean, it, the, definitely if you could try out some designs before you actually build something, uh, that's a very good investment. Um, and then um, as often as you can. How about OCLC and DLC? Do you do the usability testing for the editors? Um, in general, for production systems, okay. we do. We have a user experience and uh, usability testing group. But that uh, not applied to the, the prototype that I work okay. on, but yeah. um, okay. <laughs> So Thank you. And then FC. We do, a, we do a little. The pattern that seems to have emerged recently um, is a feature is added to the editor. Um, and then we have a couple of people who work in the instructional department who will in fact be the ones who impart this knowledge to the catalogers, test it out for us um, so that they can tell us what works and what's not going to work. And they kind of, they run, they act as intermediaries in many ways between us and the catalogers just because they're, it's their job to, to be the instructors to the catalogers. So, if it checks those boxes and then goes to the catalogers and then it still might come back to us um, because you know the catalogers, the catalogers said, you know, it would be really handy if we could have not just the alternate names, but could you so, show all the sources too when, when there's a mouse over. And then, At the point, say all of those instructors are from the catalogs. Right. So understand catalog. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. So let's thank uh, all to our presenters.
responsible for technical services at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And she is currently chair of the PCC Standing Committee on Training and a member of the Policy Committee. And she is the PI for uh, Penn, uh, Penn State's, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> UPenn, <laughs> UPenn's as you for Pete, uh, second grant, uh, sub grant, and lead uh, UPenn's share BDA program. Well, everybody, a uh, great discussion so far. So I, I wanted to see. I wanted to give just a little bit of introduction before we get into the discussion. And and um, in thinking about this topic, is like what uh, training is important from a number of perspectives. But um, uh, so I was thinking about my personal journey learning about linked data, but also um, the training that we've attempted at Penn over the last few months, and uh, then um, wearing my PCC hat. Um, we were in discussion forming a, a, cha a new group on link data training and working between the Standing Committee on Training and the Link Data Advisory Committee. So Steve and I are uh, in discussions about this group, but thinking about what kind of training is useful and um, for, for learning. And so I started thinking about what are the questions that we might want to talk about and, um, and thinking about how we accommodate different learning styles how can we reach different audiences? And so this group here, of course, today is mostly interested in Kettle and the metadata professionals, but there are others that need to learn about linked data. Um, and we did have some discussion, um, I think yesterday, you know, like the meetings are all blur, starting to blur at the end of this, this session about how we uh, sell linked data to administrators. So we need to be able to talk about linked data to administrators who don't care about RD statements and those kinds of things. Um, but also, there's other librarians that maybe gave up on Mark, but might be interested in linked data, and how do we train them? Maybe not training in the same way we train catalogers, but um, talk to them, teach them about linked data more is important. Um, and then I was thinking the different levels of training and what are the good approaches, and I'm hoping some of you will share what you've done in your institutions. Uh, and we have the conceptual or competency-based level of uh, understanding what linked data is all about, and then the practical hands-on, and there may be other uh, levels in there as well. Um, and then the last question was, how can we leverage what's already been done? And um, my last slide, and I'll go back to the questions before we start, is I pulled together a few resources uh, of things that are already available. And, um, and the, the first one there on the list is one that was just mentioned, the uh, competency index. Um, there's the training plan for the LD, the P2 cohort institutions, um, which, through at the moment. Uh, the, the Catalogers Learning Workshop has a lot of the resources that the Library of Congress has developed for their own catalogers. Alex has a whole series of webinars. Uh, there actually are two separate series, one done in 2016 and one done in 2018, um, of varying levels of usefulness, but um, they're still mostly good. Um, and then uh, there's a, a PCC a Standing Committee on Training uh, about three years ago did a, a release of a report of various data resources available. And some of those got fed back into, got fed into the uh, LD for PD competencies. So there's a lot of cross-pollination of ideas and what's available. But if you're looking for a place to start, here's some um, resources. So I'm going to um, go back to the questions and, um, and throw it out to uh, the group, particularly interested in hearing uh, approaches you've taken at your own institutions. Um, I'll share my story if other people, but I want to start with the audience and see what you're interested in talking about. Um, so if I can start, uh, my institution actually hasn't done any uh, training for linked data, and but we are trying to uh, host all available webinars by uh, linked data groups or AALX and so on, but that's it. It is really difficult for us to carve out our times to set on you know, our own linked data trainings and so on. And the reason behind is that for now, we don't do any linked data production work in our institution, our library. And we have so, so many backlogs that we really need to tackle on. So that is where we are now. So we are kind of waiting that whether, uh, when, the library system is ready, and the B-frame is ready, and LC is fully on board of, ready for the uh, linked data and so on. So we are watching, waiting and watching stage right now. So we're 
starting, uh, one of the um, colleagues from the University of Houston has come up with her own training program for her staff. And so we're talking about adapting that for the group of three or four of us, just a small group of us from all different institutions, and then having a monthly uh, phone call with each other and to, to discuss it because um, we don't know anybody. survey was intentionally subjective. It wasn't a test. It was, we actually we used, we were, <laughs> our uh, assessment librarian suggested that we use a scale of 0 to 100 <laughs> <laughs> for each of these competency questions. So it'll be, I, I actually haven't looked at the results. Have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll share what we did at Penn. So uh, we're part of the We have a linked data team that's sort of leading things, but then we also identified a cohort of catalogers, and um, and there was the training plan uh, I think it was on the other side, um, that was released. But the videos were slow in coming, and I thought these people want to learn, so what can we do? So I went out there and I looked at these uh, the resources I pulled and others, and I made a spreadsheet of all the avail freely available videos about uh, linked data mm -hmm. and set up a weekly brown bag lunch. It's not required, but people are pretty much coming uh, every week. And some people that want to eat in their office watch it on their own. Some people watch it at home eating popcorn, Jackie. <laughs> um, but the idea is just to, to, to go through and make sure that people are getting the vocabulary in, in the concepts and hearing them over and over again. Um, and it was interesting because last week when the most recent of the uh, LC videos came out, it was um, mostly a repeat for, because we have been through this process. The, this is the, the video on LinkedIn data training that just came out. Um, so, um, so we were discussing at our weekly viewing, what's next? And we decided that next week, mo Monday, we're gonna actually play with the, uh, do the hands-on and just kind of walk ourselves through the editor. Um, because we, Sonobia's not ready yet, but we want, we're at the point where we want to be doing that hands-on. I'll say at Harvard, we've taken a similar approach. It's a little uneven within our st staff, uh, but um, in, in that some of us have taken Library Juice Academy mm. courses on Semantic Web, gone through that and then not had anything to do <laughs> with it. Um, um, we've had very small projects that haven't really gained um, large participation, but with, with the LD4P grant, We've done a similar thing where we've set up what we're calling study halls or bi-weekly. We talk about the, vid the LC training videos. We talk about any webinars that, that come or come we come across. We share things that we've discovered on our own. Um, we've, we've delved into the BibFrame editor just for practice. Um, and some of us also have some, we had a Wikidata training on campus um, back in the fall. So, so we've We've delved a little bit into Wikidata, um, creating things, playing with gadgets, um, but I sharing. Will, I, I will say that um, much of that was, or, or the biggest groups that that's been involved in is the um, Centralized Technical Services Unit, and that Harvard is, of course, a large, complex organization. Um, so while some of our colleagues, like Linda, have been coming, and Robin's been you know, there are people at, there are libraries that have never really had any kind of ongoing participation in any of this training for various reasons. You know, we have multiple libraries currently going, undergoing renovations, and of course their staff are not able to just sort of be as involved as they might like. Um, but we have 
also tried, we have a, a monthly catalogers discussion group, um, and so there have been programming related to linked data going back really as far as sort of BibFrame was a thing that you could do some presentation with, including the initial BibFrame editor, um, and as much of that as possible. And I know some units as well, I think, Hoden, right, you had watched that a lot. seems to me that any group that was discussing their local policy on how to use dollar zero dollar one is actually having a linked data capital discussion in my mind. And you know, it doesn't seem to me that you have to take the whole hog, oh how are we thinking about moving all the way to be having meaningful discussions about how everyday practice can take in linked data principles. I don't know whether people are thinking about it like that. So actually, I completely agree with you. So it's, I think it is a matter of how we approach linked data types of training. So some staff members are completely fine with what kind of impact that their different practice, like adding zero, uh, software zero and software one, will be different impact on users. I think that is completely fine and enough for certain levels of catalogers. But some catalogers, I think they need to understand the back end side of why we made that kind of decisions and what kind of things that we needed to consider to add because there are so many different the different the URIs that we can add in different fields. So how are we going to modelize those kind of training for different needs? Jeanette, do you have something? Yeah, and I was just wondering as well, like the meetings that people are having to um, discuss the Say everybody, Shanians, are you including everybody? Only, only librarians?
statement. Let's look at the let's look at the output in RDF, and you can kind of see what's going on without get really getting into the weeds. It sort of helped with like this, I don't know, level of relaxing and saying, you know, I'm not going to need to learn that, but when I do look at it, I can I can kind of see what's going on. So that was a big help for us, just a level of comfort. Yeah, it's it's sometimes useful to remind people that a mark record is not what you see on the screen, but yeah. it's a string of characters that go on. Right. <laughs> model so you're just kind of entering things access points but but for better
better or worse, however, however you feel about the RDA, Ferber, LRN model, it is a model which we haven't had before. Um, so I, to me, I think that's the key competency for catalogers and metadata professionals to be able to, to model the bibliographic universe and think of it consciously and engage in those discussions. Um, Audrey and I have been working with um, faculty and grad students on a, a wiki-based project that I alluded to. And, and it's called the Black Bibliography Project, so it's it's kind of melding descriptive bibliographic practice with cataloging practice. And we found, I think, um, I don't know if you agree with me, Audrey, but it seems like, um, so we've come up with a very detailed style manual and um, set of instructions, and we've implemented a, a data model in Wikibase based on the, the kind of um, entities that are important to descriptive bibliographic practice. And we found that the grad students and, and the faculty that we've worked with have really been able to kind of digest the data model, but they've struggled more with how do how do you encode an extent statement? <laughs> um, and how do you do these things that are kind of more get to the minutiae of cataloging practice rather than modeling a domain? Um, and I actually think this is sort of leads into question number two, getting back to this point about sort of what to do when you don't have work to do, like work to do. Um, there are ways I think that we can talk about sort of where the mark record will be different from a linked data record or conceptually, like, and this happens, and not just ones and zeros and fours, but transformation as well. Um, there's, and I think we can even start, there's a OCLC video about cataloging defensively where um, uh, Jay Wertz talks about kind of the importance of granularity of data, particularly in the 5XX nodes. You want to get away from a generic 500 field and into something that says something more precise about the content of the data that you're adding. And I think there are ways that you can use kind of that conceptual model as well to kind of break out the mark record to say, you know, we've got these implied subjects, which is the sort of overall resource, and in the future we're going to be more explicit about these relationships, so we're still maybe going to say the same things, but we're going to frame it differently, and the assumptions that we make when we look at a record in its entirety versus the individual elements, and I think that's a way to think about it, training it as well, right? It's that this, there's, there will be similarities going forward in kind of the description, descriptive practice, but the way we structure that So does anybody feel like that the generalist training, other librarians, administrators, probably for general?
there's no there. <laughs> um, like there, the, there's no reason for me to invest the intellectual energy of my administrators if I can't show them a result. Um, and that's just that's the reality that at least I'm in. to put it in and see what it looks like then for the day for the day. Like, how would this help? And that would involve your reference libraries, and that would involve, because you can start having those conversations, and that affects your training, and it becomes yes. a cycle. But without being able to show anything, yes, yes it, you're not going to complete that whole training process. Yeah. I think, I mean, there's, the, there's also the kind of, if you need support to participate in a project, how do you give, make it concrete enough people that are at a very high level to understand why working towards a future that they can't see yet um, is important. Well, I'm going to mention what you did. <laughs> but, you know, we have used it at our institution to do, I don't know if it's cataloging outreach to reference librarians or other people in the institution to do work um, tied into things like open access week, where we not only Whether do we know how much linked data part of the education is done in library school as well? Because the future of our profession is actually <laughs> depends on library education. But I'm not sure how much focus on linked data is included in digital library classes or yes, yeah, cataloging uh, classes. Yeah, I just did that a couple of semesters ago, one credit class. Oh, okay. Months, but it was pretty intensive. Wow. covers two or three modules. A semester. Yeah. No, no, I mean, two, three, two or three weeks, which means that nine hours or yeah, less than 10 hours. Um, it's, a, it's an asynchronous class, and so it depends on how much reading I've put in that and how fast I can read it. Or if yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I teach one of, one of those, like you were mentioning before, kind of that introductory class that everybody has to take. Typically, people end up hanging more. I try to, you know, I think I succeed at bringing them around by the end. But I think part of the challenge right now for that kind of introductory level required class is that we're in this transitional time. This is one of the first things I say to them. Mm -hmm. You need 
to understand Mark, you're going to need to understand the frame. You need to have an introduction to linked data. You need to understand kind of the larger world of metadata. There are a lot of concepts to bring in at an introductory level. And so that's one thing that I'm, um, I'm also teaching, you know, I didn't design the curriculum right now, so I'm involved in trying to, you know, try to help with this transition. But I think that's, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in kind of emerging at this conversation is, and I keep going back and forth, do we start with the um, kind of baby steps of details, or do we start with the big picture? My method right now is kind of going back and forth between the two to try to help them see the relationships. But I'm, you know, I don't know if anybody else has had has any thoughts, has had any other particular successes with that that balance. That's a, that's a really interesting question to me. So I was an original cataloger for three years, um, and and my first exposure to cataloging was in a catalog and the first, very first class was all about perimeter. And I did not understand any of it. And I was like, I'm not gonna be good at this. Like, this would not be a path for me. But as time went on, we start doing practical stuff and I was like, oh, this is actually something I might enjoy. So that's one perspective. Well, and I, and I think sometimes it is kind of different, um, it timed in with different learning styles and different, you know, some people are attracted to different parts. So how can we, and then going back to, I think this is what you said before, you know, how, how do we bring in different people into the profession that have these different skills? When I was in my preschool, it's just you know, seven-ish years ago. Um, my introduction—we usually spent maybe a month on linked data. It was so bad that <laughs> I—it was—it was—it was done by somebody who was doing PhD research in linked data stuff. And it, you know, people try to like over. I think over, you know, people try to oversell stuff. But sometimes when approaching library students, it's really okay to be like, be like, we're going to talk about Shakespeare as an example here. Like, yeah, it's real basic, it's real bookish, but. When it comes down to it, I think you know we do want to err on the side of bid frame. And I've also talked to some library school teachers. Like, bid frame is not doesn't it doesn't really exist. Like if we're going to be super honest, you know you can't say you're going to get a cataloging job and you're going to be sitting down and doing bid frame. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So there's a lot of um, angst there about that. And it was some similar when we were getting to these like big ideas that had no no practicality. So I think. Um, yeah, trying to come up with some things that actually exist and some examples that maybe are kind of basic but at least let you see how you could do inferencing or things like that. It's just, yeah, it put me off so bad that, you know, I, I feel like I lost a couple of years of potential learning from that class. I mean, now I'm a LinkedIn strategist, so, you know, <laughs> it's a happy ending, but I, seriously. Ha <laughs> ha 